think of the passage in Revelation chapter 5 at the very end. John is writing here and he's telling us about what the future looks like. You want to know what the future looks like? It looks a little bit like this. He says, then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. We worship the Lamb. That's what we're here to do. We're worshiping our Christ. This is an evening of worship, not your normal Calvary Bible Church spring concert, because you get to participate. And this will be quite a treat, because you get to rehearse a little bit of what it's going to be like to be in heaven, to speak of the Lamb, to speak of Christ and His work, all that He has done, and all that He has done in particular to those who would believe. And we heard this morning about what it means to place your faith and trust in, in Jesus Christ to find life. So if you're here today, tonight, and you, you've placed your faith in Christ, then worship the Lamb. Will you do that? Stand with me, if you would. Let's begin our time and open in prayer, and then remain standing, if you would, as we sing together the doxology. Great God, we look forward to the day where we will be in eternity worshiping the Lamb. But you've not just reserved that day for then. You've given us the opportunity to do so now. And so, Father, receive our offering, our sacrifice of praise. Receive this gift as weak and as insignificant as we are. Receive it, and great Savior, you present it before the Father, knowing that it will be presented with your blood and with your righteousness. And Father, we ask that you would receive it with joy, that your people love you and give themselves to you. Now oh God, ignite our hearts with these truths that we're about to hear and rehearse before us. Let us learn from these truths. Let us apply these truths to our hearts and our lives. And let us see you as mighty and as grand and as glorious as you are. For you alone are worthy to be praised and honored. Thank you, God, for being our God and for loving us in Christ. We pray and ask these things in Christ's name. 
Amen. Now remain standing and let's sing.
programs tonight, you will see And Can It Be is next on the program, and it's one of my very, very favorite hymns. Charles Wesley, just as absolutely a marvelous text writer, pay great attention to these words as you get the opportunity to just sing. And Can It Be. Let's stand as we sing these four stanzas together and sing out, please. Sing with great praise in your heart.
just to point out, you'll notice when they come up, one of the girls is wearing a ribbon. In children's choir, every quarter, we send them home with a few hymns and give them the challenge of memorizing the hymns. For each verse of the hymn that they come back, they get a, they get a, a prize. And if they are able to memorize all three of the hymns, they get to wear a ribbon in the concert. And one of our girls, Abby Trapp, was able to get all of the hymns memorized, and so you'll notice that she is wearing a ribbon tonight. Now join us as we praise God in song. Oh. 
opportunity to sing together tonight as we sing the beautiful before the throne of God above. I think most of you will find this a familiar hymn. Hopefully it is. We're going to sing all three stanzas. There's so many truths wrapped into this song. And just think as you sing, intelligently as you sing the words. Take them into your heart and into your life. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful hymn. Let's sing it together as we worship. Let's stand, please.
men come forward if you would. This is a, it's called the time for the offering, and it simply is this. Traditionally, we have given funds at our concerts specifically to help our benevolence. And what we seek to do is do two things with the money that comes in for benevolence. Uh, we seek to meet the needs, ongoing needs, of our own church family, but just as important as that is, there's a number of folks in our community who also come with needs and we seek to help meet their needs as well. So please know that the money that is given will be go directly to our Benevolence Fund in order to help others. And so uh, if you're visiting here, please do not feel like you must give. If you want to give, we certainly welcome that as it will go to our Benevolence Fund. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of giving. You have given to us in abundance. Every need that we could possibly have has been fulfilled in Christ. We need nothing. But God, you've set us here in this world that has many needs around us. And God, you've given us the privilege of loving others as Christ has loved us. And so with the funds that are given, we seek to glorify your name. We seek to demonstrate your love for us by giving to those who need it. I pray, God, that you would bless this offering. Lord, use this money uh, for the effective outreach of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that many would see Christ and come to know him through these funds. We pray and ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.
There is a little bit of an agenda here tonight, a little bit of a theme that you've probably seen woven in and out of the hymns that we're singing. We take a stand here that is culturally not often accepted. We, off, we take a, a stand here about what you've heard tonight in an environment of relativism where truth is relative, truth doesn't really mean anything, and what we need to be is politically correct. What we need to do is say the things that bring us together rather than say the things that would divide. But when I read the verse in Revelation talking about what will happen someday, what I didn't read to you was all the things that happened before that in the Bible. If you go clear back to the very beginning of Scripture, you begin with a very, very important foundation that says this, in the beginning, God. And it states right off the bat what none of us as sinful human beings want to hear and understand is that there is a final authority. There is a beginning authority. And He is God, Jehovah, Yahweh. And in the beginning, God did something. He created. He made out of nothing everything that you see. Humanity, the things that are in the world, every aspect of it. The scripture said it was good. In fact, it was good, 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 good. And then he made humanity, and at the very end, he looked at everything he said and he made, and he goes, that's very good. 
Very good. It was perfect. And he sat down with humanity and he looked at Adam and Eve and he said, look, you can have everything. Just enjoy everything that you see around you. But that one tree, you cannot have. And as you've heard so many times from this pulpit, humanity, instead of wanting the lavished, loving kindness of our God, turned its back on God and said, no, I want my own way. I want to act as if life were about me. I want to minimize my life and say, I want that tree. And God warned them. God said, the minute you do that, you will die. You will no longer be reflecting my glory. You will no longer be living in my holiness. You will be pursuing your own glory. And the moment you do that, you will be separate from me. That's what death is, separated from God. They did not experience physical death, although they began to experience that physical death. And in doing so, there was one thing that was needed in order for them to gain back that which they lost. They lost life. They lost righteousness. They lost the perfection that was theirs. And that Bible continues with one story after the next about the results of that loss. Man's pride, man's willfulness, man's focus upon his own glory gave himself to death over and over and over. Not only physical death, as you read scripture, you see humanity dying over and over and over again, but gave himself to living a death-like position. That is, pretending in life that they can go through life without God. I can have my own way. And all the destruction that that brought on humanity. Scripture says in Genesis chapter 3 and Genesis chapter 4 that at the very beginning, fear came into the heart of humanity. Fear, anxiety, stress, because man said, I want to do my own thing. God warned him. God in his loving kindness in that warning said, but don't despair totally because I'm going to send a Savior. I'm going to send a Redeemer. In Genesis chapter 3.15 sends a clear picture to all who would believe there's coming a day when there's a Redeemer. In the meantime, he set up a sacrificial system where the innocent would give their life in order that humanity might gain a glimpse of what the coming Lamb would look like and what the coming Lamb would do. That coming Lamb came literally hundreds of years later in the form of a babe in a manger. And so the whole Old Testament is that looking for that Redeemer. And humanity would, would raise up a king, they would raise up prophets, and everyone would go, well, maybe it's him, maybe it's him, and maybe it's him. And it never was until Jesus Christ came. Scripture says in John chapter 1 that Jesus came into his own, and his own still did not receive him. But there were some who did. And as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And how did he do that? He did what only Jesus Christ could do. What only the God-man, the only the perfect God and man could do. And that is he gave of his life. Just like the millions and millions of lambs that had done it years before on a sacrifice. The innocent died for the guilty. That's our Jesus. And he died for the sins of the likes of you and me. And he did it so that we could return back to where we came from. He did it so he would reverse the curse. So the curse would no longer have effect. And we sang about that. Sin's curse had lost its grip on me. And now I am his and he is mine. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. The song that they just finished singing. Jesus paid it all. And scripture is very clear. That what we need is righteousness. What humanity needs today is not a better economy. What humanity needs today is not a better government, not a better health care, not a better financial situation. What we need is righteousness. In order to get back to where we belong with God, we need perfect righteousness. We don't have it. But in Christ, when he died, two things took place. Number one, he took your sin and mine. Upon himself, the innocent for the guilty. 
And not only did he take our sin, but to those that would believe, he gave us his perfect righteousness. So that those who would place their faith and trust in Him, as God would look down upon them, they no longer see them, He sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we are counted free. The hymn writer says that perfectly. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on Him was laid. Here, in the death of Christ, I live. And now, my friend, if you're here tonight and you say, you know what? I, I don't have that righteousness. I don't have that subtleness that if I were to die right now, that I would face eternity with God as I should be. My friend, I would encourage you to run to Christ. Jesus did pay it all. And really, all to Him we owe. Sin has left its crimson stain. Why? Because he washed it white as snow. Place your faith and trust upon Jesus. I'm so glad that you're here. Many of you are here because you were invited by a friend, a friend who cares for you, a friend who wants you to hear the truth. There's a lot of folks that wouldn't want you to hear this truth. They would want you to hear some religious mumbo-jumbo, religious jargon that would make political sense. It doesn't make sense that the sinless would die for the sinful. Does it make sense that the perfect one would die for the guilty? But that, my friend, is the power of the cross. That those who are dead in their trespasses and sin would have life. Not only would have it life, but would have it more abundantly. We're going to finish tonight our time together with singing about this power. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 the gospel is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believeth, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. It's for you tonight that if you would place your faith and trust in Jesus, you too would know the power of the cross. Let's stand and sing this tonight as we finish our, our time together.
God, for your forgiveness in Christ. Thank you for the life that is ours in him. God, I pray that as we leave here, that our hearts would continue to rejoice. May this not be the end of our evening of praise. May our evening of praise spill over into a day of praise all day tomorrow, a week of praise. As we live for you, as we not only speak of your name, but we live out your perfect righteousness in a way that demonstrates your love, that demonstrates your mercy and your loving kindness and gives to others the wonderful good news that there is a Redeemer, there is a Savior, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And may our lives speak of that. And may others come to Christ because of the message of our life. Now, Lord, watch over us, keep us, make your face to shine upon us, and may we live for you this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night. Thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm.